Hi, I'm Vicky Ann, founder and director of Creative Recruiters. Welcome to the Creative Studio Insider Podcast. My special guest today is Hannah Schenkel. Hannah is the brand and creative services manager at a company called Bluestone. Thanks so much for joining me today, Hannah. Thanks for having me. How are things up there in Sydney? No doubt you're moving around with a wee bit more freedom than we have here in Melbourne. Uh, yes, no, I'm... I feel so sorry for you guys. One of my colleagues is down there and it's just, it's very sad to say. I'm very happy with my freedom, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, look, it's um, awful to see. It is. It really, really is. But, you know, we're, we're, we're getting a bit too used to it now, I think. Um, let me start by asking you to share um, a little bit about Bluestone for those, for those that don't know the company or don't recognise the brand. Yeah, absolutely. So Bluestone is a home loan provider with over 20 years experience. We're, uh, we're based in Sydney, but have um, sales managers across Australia and we also operate in New Zealand. Uh, we provide home loans essentially for people who might not be serviced quite so well by the big banks. So we specialise in home loans for people like self-employed people, people who may have had credit, imp credit impairments in the past. Um, uh, professional property investors and various other people who need a more personal approach to their credit assessment. We don't use credit scoring. We have a very personal approach to everything we do and uh, so it can help more people get home loans effectively. Okay. Well, that's a good service. So, so how, you, you, you started out as a writer, I noticed, um, on your CV. Tell, tell me about the journey that you've been on that, um, that, which is how you ended up here at Bluestone. Yes, absolutely. So I studied writing and cultural studies at uni and was always kind of equally interested in the writing part and the cultural studies, which encompasses anything from sociology and uh, history and psychology um, to kind of discover how people think, how, how cultures are formed, how preconceptions are formed, how to influence people. Those kinds of questions are all kind of under that umbrella. And after uni, um, I then went on and did my master's degree in nonfiction writing, so editing and profile writing, various other kind of more applicable uh, types of writing, but kind of found that I was not necessarily that employable by the end of all that because I didn't really want to be a journalist. It wasn't really the kind of journey I was on and decided to do an internship in a marketing agency effectively and worked with them for about two years and kind of slowly took on more responsibility and took on a lot of their clients. I was already set up as a freelance uh, writer for film criticism. So I was just working as a contractor effectively for a lot of, um, for, through this agency, but for a lot of financial services clients uh, primarily, who then kind of recommended me to other people and a few times directors went off and started their own business and I helped them brand their businesses and I just sort of by accident almost built myself a little marketing consultancy and eventually just kind of found that I really enjoyed the marketing a lot more than the writing and production and started to pursue that a little bit more in depth and um, after a while I think I hit a bit of a ceiling because you can't you can only learn so much when you're by yourself and that never really worked with a marketing team properly. So I started to look for in-house opportunities to be able to learn from a team and have that support um, of a company and ended up at Bluestone and I've been there ever since and loving it. And did the role of creative services manager always exist at Bluestone? No, no. I, I started at Bluestone as a content, um, as a content manager. So looking after their kind of, blog like it's a knowledge center and looking after all their messaging and advertising was basically a content copywriter really and um, from there on just sort of started to get an interest in brand and brand marketing and slowly took on more responsibility and kind of as time went on I was taking over the kind of ownership of the websites and keeping the websites updated and then overseeing the design agency we're working with and just slowly and surely this role developed until I kind of ended up as creative services manager. 
And tell me about your team. <clears throat> what is the, what's the makeup of the team? What type of job titles and responsibilities? Uh, we've got nine marketers at the moment recruiting for our team soon. Um, only two of us are really kind of explicitly creative services. So our content and copywriter and me as the creative services manager that um, all uh, the rest of the team all do a little bit of creative work just to an extent. Um, but we are supported by a whole stable of freelancers and agencies who we really kind of we work with as an extension of our team. They're all long-term relationships. They're all people who kind of we quite regularly interact with and would kind of see as part of the team. So there's a couple of designers now, there's a video production crew, there is a front-end developer who looks after all our websites, there's copywriters. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anyone, I might be. And, and what type of projects are running through the studio at the moment, for example? I mean, we're almost entirely a B2B brand. So a lot of what we always do tends to be presentations and kind of, uh, that kind of work for uh, our sales team to be able to uh, give with brokers across Australia. So presentation is a big one. We're managing three websites because we have the Bluestone brand and then two white label brands as well that we look after. There's a lot of product collateral and a lot of um, a lot of application forms and flyers and, and educational kind of collateral, as you can imagine, for a lender that always has to be updated. Uh, we do very regular videos, both for social media and for our EVMs and for um, events, and we are doing a fair bit of above the line, below the line advertising at this stage as well. Wow. So it's, it's a mix of just about everything. Oh, and a little bit, very small amount of merch. <laughs> How does the ideation process work at Bluestone then? Because you've got your team and you've also got the team of freelancers. Um, can you take us through the, process, the design process that works best for you? Um, it very much depends on the project. Uh, for small projects, we like to give, like, especially the designer, a fair bit of freedom at this stage because she's worked with us for so long and she knows us really, really well. So there tends to be very little briefing at this stage for her and she just knows what to do and comes up with amazing ideas every time. For, for larger campaigns and larger things, we tend to start with a group meeting with um, all the relevant stakeholders in the room together and we just throw ideas kind of on a whiteboard or in our case, mostly actually a Trello board. So we just go around the room and just put every single idea onto Trello and then we go through vertically um, defending each idea effectively. So people need to kind of take ownership of an idea and think through, would this actually work? Is this a good idea? Is this the most effective kind of, uh, is, is this the most effective way of, uh, of proceeding? And eventually that would also sit down to two or three ideas maybe that we can then mock up and kind of play around with a little bit more, have our copywriter refine and maybe play with a little bit. Mm. And from there, we arrive at the final product. Thank goodness for Trello. It's a, it's a great project oh. for that sort of thing, isn't it? Oh yes, fantastic. Um, since a lot of creatives come from arts backgrounds, writing, designing, producing for commercial outcomes can be a mindset shift that some teams or some creatives struggle with. Um, that, you know, it can cloud decision making. Can you tell us how you manage that inside of such a diverse team? I think for me, it, it starts with a good brief, like having absolute clarity about what is trying to be achieved, who we're speaking to, and what's important to those audiences, I think helps to focus work and helps to give designers and creatives the boundaries that they need to be able to address those challenges. And I think it's also um, a big challenge is also to make sure that creatives have enough of a marketing background or at least enough context to be able to understand how and why certain things work and to be able to step outside of their own sphere and look at work from the customer's point of view rather than their own because often what's most beautiful or most well-written isn't actually what will work best and I think 
coaching creatives to step out of what their preference is into what is best for the brand is a process, but I think if there's a good brief, it's a lot easier to just go back to the brief and give feedback and refine work without hurting feelings and mm. moving forward. Did you need to define that briefing process over time? We're still refining, <laughs> or always refining. Um, but I think most important is to have a really clear understanding of who the customer is. I think if, if a team has empathy and has a good understanding of who they're talking to, that's half the battle already won because then they can think themselves into those shoes and kind of try and step outside themselves. Mm. Financial services is a complex beast. How do you effectively make sure that your business strategy is translated in the creative work that you're producing? Um, I'm a big believer in the very traditional order of having diagnosis first, strategy second, and execution third. And I think agile and kind of various more modern ways of working have their place. But I think in terms of creative work, without first fully understanding exactly what we're trying to achieve, what is important, and then creating a strategy that truly defines the objectives, the messaging, the audiences, the targeting, I think creative work becomes far less effective and far less focused. So I think that early work has to be done before we start to think about channel and tactical execution. And once that's in place, it really becomes a lot easier to create creative work that really hits the mark. Mm. Where do you tend to do your best thinking? Is it driving to work? Um, it is jogging, I would say. I, I, I like to go jogging at least two or three times a week and that tends to give me time to either listen to podcasts and books and things that I've been meaning to listen to or listen to music and just let my mind flow and kind of I do a lot of reflection while jogging and I also find if I have if I have a problem that I'm avoiding because I just can't think my way through it I like to book a meeting with a colleague. I've got one colleague in particular who has to take the brunt of that a lot of the time because <laughs> she's just very good at bouncing ideas off of. She's really good at reflecting my thoughts back to me. And we tend to both be able to really well focus our minds and just work through problems together. And almost every time, if I'm, with, if I'm avoiding a problem, I know I just need to have a meeting with any of our team members because they're all extremely intelligent and supportive people. But certainly I want colleague in particular I think we tend to be very good at nutting our problems together and just mm. getting things done. It's wonderful when there's a, a, a part a, a partnership like that inside of a, <laughs> um, a a team where you can turn to and you know half the time when you're saying the problem to someone all of a sudden the answer comes to you anyway. Yeah exactly sometimes just as I'm speaking out loud I'm answering my own question that tends to happen a lot. <laughs> For sure. All my ideas seem to happen in the shower. I'm constantly yelling out to Siri to make notes for me. <laughs> it's, it's... Which was the case for me in the shower. I have to go, to, like, I'm somewhat, my mind races all the time. So unless I'm doing something actually quite strenuous, I just, my mind doesn't focus enough to actually have intelligent thoughts because I just didn't get distracted. No, I completely understand. And look, you know, design is a living discipline. Um, and as with any other practice that, it, that evolves and changes over time, what are the most notable changes that you've noticed in the past couple of years, do you think? I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that question because I'm a writer technically. I'm not a designer and design is my kind of, not my, it's, I'm okay at it, but it's not my strongest what thing. Writing? What about writing then? Because oh. writing has definitely changed. Oh, yeah, sure. Writing does definitely change um, all the time. But I think just as a general rule, I'd, I'd say being a brand manager as well as a creative services person, I have to give the boring answer that I think the changes and the trends are less important than the consistency and distinctiveness of the brand. And I'm always very wary of jumping on to too many trends and making too many changes. And obviously, our work should always be up to date and should be modern and should be speaking to 
audiences um, throughout time mm -hmm. and evolved as such. But I think it's it's a pitfall for a lot of creatives to be following the trends, whereas I think it's far more important for an effect for effective brand execution to be working in very consistent and distinctive guidelines. And that might sound boring to a lot of people. And I think a lot of uh, creatives especially find that really re restrictive and really would prefer a lot more freedom. But I actually find that really exciting. I, I like working within constraints and I think it, it's a lovely challenge and I think it, it can sharpen and focus creativity to be working in those constraints. Do you think there's a vast difference between skill and talent? Can someone be skilled and make up for the shortfall of talent, do you think? I mean, I, I don't know that there is a vast difference. And I think both is needed to be truly successful. I think a lot of the time, no matter how much talent you have, unless you have diligence and the ability to build on what you are doing and learn new skills, you will not be able to succeed. But I think at the same time, especially for creatives, if there isn't that spark and that innate talent, at least to some extent, no matter how much you train, you will probably never get your work from adequate to truly exceptional. I think there's certainly a level of just general affinity that I think is needed, certainly in creative fields. Yeah. And you've got a big team. They say negativity kills creativity. How do you keep a positive environment in your studio, especially, you know, during those times when your team's working remotely? Uh, our team is really, really close. and We, we have catch-ups quite regularly. And I think the environment we have in our team is one of shared success and shared failure. We're trying very hard to be open and honest, especially like the leadership in our team and me certainly with my direct reports, I'm trying very hard to be really approachable and very, very real and also very transparent about my own shortcomings or failures or worries or fears mm. so that they know that there isn't a need to mask if they're concerned about something or if something went wrong and to be able to kind of share what's worrying them. And so we just, you know, we try to be supportive and I think we are really a very supportive team and try and find ways to have fun together as, as much as possible. It's not always possible, but we do try. Your team's really lucky to have you because I think the most successful managers are definitely those that are, you know, you use the word masked, you know, completely unmasked, fully transparent, completely authentic. Um, able to say when they've messed up and it just creates that culture where people can tell you anything it's very important mm -hmm. at creative recruiters um, I, you know that open honest communication means that there's always a solution isn't there oh yeah ab absolutely and I do have to give credit there to our head of marketing as well and to the other uh, senior managers in the team I think there's very much that is and really also Bluestone as a whole, I think that's really, there's a point being made about that honesty and openness. And certainly our, our head of marketing absolutely makes sure that we're able to take leave whenever we need to and have flexibility in our days and are able to be honest about mm. where we're at. And I think he, he really kind of sets the tone and it's very easy for me as a manager to then carry that forward as well. Oh, it sounds like a wonderful company, that, that's for sure. What's, what's one thing that you wish you had known at the beginning of your career, something that you know now that you wish you knew back then? I think the importance of being trained and ongoing learning and training, I think I would have, if I would have valued that more at the beginning, I think I could have solved myself some heartache a little bit, like I saved myself rather some heartache early on because like I mentioned before I came from not a marketing background and just sort of fell into marketing and became quite kind, kind of relatively senior quite quickly just by nature of where I was at the time and I think 
there was a lot of unnecessary stress that I could have saved myself if I'd earlier started to make a point of training myself and finding the resources that I needed, the books and the podcasts to really know what I was doing. And I think once I hit the point where I burned out because of just too much stress and needed to reset and I just made the decision to really make sure that I was going to have all the uh, resources I needed going forward to be successful. I think I really noticed such an absolute change in the trajectory of my career and also just in my happiness and my confidence and my ability to be really effective Mm. and happy in my role. Mm. And it is the secret, isn't it? I think that, um, you know, particularly managers like yourself who have Um, found yourself in in that position quite early on in their career the the common thread is is that they didn't sit back and wait for the training they actually went and they got it yes absolutely and I think that's what I tell everyone who will listen and some people who don't want to that it's really learning is not something you do once a year at your personal development kind of training course from the company it's something you have to try and work into your day-to-day, find the opportunities, find the things that work for you. And there's so many resources out there that can make it really pleasurable and really easy. And I I don't find it a hardship at all. Like I found the resources that I enjoy listening to and I found the podcasts and the books and the thinkers who I really enjoy. So it's, it's not a hardship for me to listen to that on the train to work or when I'm going jogging. It's actually something I look forward to. Mm. And I think there's resources for everyone out there to make that happen. Yeah. And, you know, ask yourself at the end of every day, what did I learn today? And there's, there's always something. Yeah, absolutely. That never stops. What, um, what brands do you admire and do you think that influence the way that you and your team are doing things cre- creatively? I don't know that there's any specific brands that I admire. I think there's campaigns I admire. I really loved the 2018, I think, tie ad commercials from the Super Bowl. Um, I the tie ad campaign, which was just fantastic. And also, I think the year after, maybe it was 2020, the, the Drape uh, slash Groundhog Day campaign, I think, was absolutely brilliant. Just in its, its messaging. I mean, I love a good tagline and I love a good story as a writer. It's just, it worked really beautifully. Mm. Uh, closer to home, I think recently I've quite enjoyed the HBF Quokkas. I think they were really effective and I think a good brand icon can really make a big difference and I think everyone quite loved them. Mm. And I think there was Leo Burnett who was working on those. But yeah, I think that was a really lovely campaign and I really enjoyed that. But just in general, I, I admire brands that have, that follow a good strategy, that have consistency in their messaging that have that take risks with their creative bit uh, strategic risks and that are human and honest mm-hmm. and you know and if I like can I say it's a giggle at the end <laughs> Hannah, it's been so lovely spending time with you. It sounds like you're doing such a wonderful job there at Bluestone. They're lucky to have you. Yes, thank you. It's really, thank you for inviting me. It's a really lovely experience and I really like your podcast. I've been listening to a few episodes and it's just really good to hear the creatives and creative managers talk about kind of how they solve challenges and kind of approach their work. No, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You take care. Thank you. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.